So if you guessed from that introduction, I'm a bit of a downer, and I have issues. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> Talk to me later. <laughs> you'll find out. Well, actually, you won't need to find out. You'll hear in about five minutes. Um, so it's wonderful to be here, and I'm very grateful to Words Aloud for inviting me out here. And I love about this festival is there's actually two Aboriginal writers here. Normally, when you're an Aboriginal writer, you're the only one at the festival, and you're kind of there on the side, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's the Aboriginal writer. Um, but no one can do that at Words Aloud because there's two of us, and we're both mean, and we can beat the heck out of anyone. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read from my uh, first collection, Ceremonies for the Dead, and um, just, you know, by way of warning, I guess, my collection is mostly about death, uh, domestic violence, native stuff, and gay sex. So it's kind of like if Lady Gaga remade the Res Sisters. Um, so consider that your trigger warning. And I was told, and so if I'm, if I'm wrong, it's not my fault, I was told that you're not easily offended as an audience and you like challenging work. Maybe it's that number 11 coming in. Um, but if you are offended, take it up with her because she told me to say whatever I wanted. So <laughs> that's what's happening. Congratulations, group trauma. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to start uh, reading in my first um, piece of Ceremonies for the Dead. And I, people always ask me about that title, Ceremonies for the Dead. And people are like, so is this, this going to teach me, you know, like Indian rituals for the dead? And the answer is no. It's poetry. It's a metaphor, people. Come on. Get with the program. Uh, so the first piece I'm going to read for you is Ceremonies for the Dead 2. If you want to conduct an Indian ceremony for the dead, gather a long white rope and one coil of sheets. No, I did that wrong. I'm starting again. I mixed up the words. If you want to conduct an Indian ceremony for the dead, gather a long white sheet and one coil of rope. Cut down a few branches from the nearest cedar. Strip the needles from the wood and crush them between your fingers. Breathe in the scent of the resulting paste as you slide warm hands over the chilled body, paying special attention to the lifeless hands, heavy limbs, and pallid lips. Light a waterproof match from your jeans and toss the weak flame into an ashtray. Smolder it with dried sage, a few strands of your hair, and put it out with a dash of whiskey. Gather the sheet and toss it over the body. Tie it on tightly so everything is covered. No loose fingers or exposed toes, just one blank bundle of nothing. Find the tallest tree in the backyard and using the coil of rope, make a noose for the feet. Truss up the woolen sack like an oversized cocoon. Strain your back until the tree branch is bowed from the weight, but remember to tie off the rope securely. Once properly hoisted, the corpse should rot in the wind and the rain for at least a couple months, maybe years, depending on your seasonal climate, and you should make no attempt to release it to the cold ground. Do not mention the deceased's name for at least 13 moons. Give away everything left, including houses, clothing, memories, and children. Every couple of days, walk out to your backyard and light up a smoke as you stand underneath the tallest tree and watch your loved one disintegrate into vital fluids, lumps of bone shrinking as the once white sheet turns red, blue, then black. Feel nothing except regret and a slow appreciation for the gestational cycle of death. I told you it was dark. What did you, <laughs> seriously? <laughs> you guys surprised? They're never inviting me back. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this next piece I'm going to read for you, I have to do a little bit of explanation I've found um, over my time of reading. For those of you that aren't going to get this unless I tell you, it's satire. 
So please don't send angry mobs after me afterwards. You'd be surprised how many people have trouble recognizing sarcasm when they hear it. Um, and the other thing I wanted to explain, because it comes up, so uh, generally speaking, when you're a half-breed like I am, you end up spending a lot of time in genealogical research. Um, uh, people who have status have this wonderful gift of the uh, Indian Act tracking all of their relatives for decades. Um, I don't know if that's really so much of a gift, but uh, there's all kinds of archival records, which are very immediate. But if you slip through the cracks, like most Métis people have, uh, the archive records get very interesting. And so I was researching my ancestors, and I kept running in, and actually on the Canadian and the American side, and I kept running into this really weird annotation and all the census records, and it was CNRW. Does anyone in the room know what CNRW stands for? Is there anyone who's some kind of amateur historian? No, all you people are sad. Um, <laughs> well, you will be after I'm from done reading, <laughs> if you aren't already. Um, so CNRW actually means uh, cannot read or write. So all my ancestors, uh, according to these wonderful census takers, were illiterate, dumb people. Uh, they spoke six languages, but you know, illiterate and dumb. So you should, you should know that because it comes up in the poem and otherwise you'll be very confused. Ceremonies for the Dead Four. If you kill a half-breed, make sure to dispose of the evidence in a culturally appropriate manner. I recommend reciting High Latin Mass while some old Indian bag lady dances counterclockwise in jeans and a beat-up fringe jacket. Give a brief eulogy in Ojibwe or Cree, but change every fourth noun to French. And smile broadly to the attending ghost, because every dead Indian loves a consummate salesman. Make sure you pay special attention to the deceased mixed heritage by telling a couple of offhand jokes about how Indian women are good in the bush but hairless in the sack. Be careful not to overstate how much Indian blood ran through their veins or you'll make them sound barbaric. Just dress up the simple details by changing trapper into freelance guide or say they lived in a shack because it brought them closer to God's creation. Don't forget to go back into the census records with a quill pen dipped in black ink so you can scratch out previous generations and leave confusing annotations like C and R W in the margins. Be sure to correct the clerk's handwriting by checking off the columns for mulatto or white if their coloring was passable. If you killed them in a remote location, I suggest digging a shallow grave with a rifle butt so the wild animals have something to eat when the freeze sets in. The worst you could do would be to give them a proper burial because of the bureaucratic headache you'll encounter. No good Christian graveyard accepts Indian corpses, and you can't take them back to the ancestral reserves where memory falls apart after one generation gone. Ignore any feelings of guilt or empathy which may disrupt your normally cheerful disposition, as there are literally thousands of half-breeds still left, and the government encourages killing at least one per hunting season. <laughs> The slow clap, clapping means the trauma is setting in. Excellent. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's two ways to go into my collection. There's a gentle way, and then there's a, a, a rough and horrible way. And I did the gentle way last night at Mokwaudong, so today I'm going for the rough and traumatic entry. Um, so this next piece is called Moshkahan, Moshkahan, the flood. And Moshkahan is a traditional Nishnabe story, which is kind of our creation story. And I was working with a, a language elder at the time, and he was talking about stories and he was always saying, you know, oh, you have to learn the stories and then you have to make them your own. And so I was like, well, okay, all right. I see you there. I'll take that challenge. Uh, so I rewrote our creation story, but um, I don't think it turned out quite the way he expected. <laughs> Moshkahan. Until he saw the earth of his seed extend away infinitely, there was nothing but corpses in cold water, a slow turning darkness living in the deep. He said a long time ago the earth was a fragment of dirt, 
clay and silica shifting beyond the point of creation, idle speculation gathering on the underside of his shoes. Us humans, sleeping limbs splayed out over beds of sweet grass, stars moving through our ghostly bodies, waiting for him to return from the sheath of nighttime. Not only his hands touched us, his tongue against our damp skin, and fingers slipping inside our bodies like minnows darting from shadow to shadow away from the sun. His cock made flesh with urgency, seeking our centers, drawing in air and moisture in stillborn lungs, the corridors of blood igniting in a slow burn as he kissed our misshapen lips. His seed, dark and gentle, pressed into our ribs as the outline of bones, cartilage taking form from his careful ministrations. Each separate act of penetration, creating one distinct galaxy in the body of a soul. Yeah. I think the gay sex metaphor wasn't what he was expecting. That was the part that threw him. The rest, he was like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> now he was cool with it. He's Cree's from up north. He was like, oh yeah, whatever. Been there, done that. I went to Woodstock. He did, actually. He was a cool elder. He dropped a lot of acid in the 70s. And he would tell you about it. Uh, and so this is, next piece I'm going to read for you is, is called Grave Digging, and there's a story with this one too. Does anyone know who Lee Miracle is? Yes. Hey, some hands in the audience. She's actually the first First Nations novelist in Canada. And to get her book published, she had to get a petition with people to sign it. She got 5,000 people to sign the petition saying they'd buy the book. And she took it to the publisher, and that's how she got published for the first time. Because they didn't think that you could sell, an Indian could sell books. And she proved them wrong. Um, and so I worked with Lee, actually. And uh, Lee told me this writing exercise that she always did where she was like, OK, so you write something, and you have to use the word euphoric. But that's it. You can do anything else. But the word euphoric has to happen in the poem. So I was like, mm, OK. Okay, all right. I'll write a poem with the word euphoric. You see a trend happening here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm something of a badass. Um, at least on Friday nights. Uh, and usually in heels. Uh, grave digging. So this is my next piece, grave digging. Well, now there's some titters, so this is good. The trauma is, is slowing down a bit. Don't worry, we'll go back to the dark soon. <coughs> grave digging. Let's go grave digging, you and me. We can go tonight, under the last moon of summer, when the ground is damp, soil loose from the weight of rainfall and humidity. We'll take your pickup truck, toss a couple of spades in the back, and slide up the deserted highway like a couple of thieving engines on horseback. Find one of those burial grounds, hidden under rows of corn in a farmer's field, and start exhuming the bodies randomly as the wind whistles past our genes. You can catalog the individual bones, femur, pelvis, and skull ridge in one pile, arrowheads and cracked pottery in another, as I thrust my fingers through the dirt to pull up handfuls of our ancestors. I brought some sandwiches and dug out a bottle of cheap wine, strong enough to get us good and drunk while we work, so the dead will see we know the proper rituals to honor the decaying underworld. Afterwards, and sweaty and covered in dust, like two cowboys riding on the Great Plains, we can hold hands or just fuck beside the exposed corpses. Because even the dead need a good show every hundred years or so. If you really love me, you'll time your orgasm perfectly just as the moon rises up from behind dark clouds and sweeps the graves with that silver Silver light, which makes the bones dance again. Doesn't this sound like a fun time? You and me lying under stars, surrounded by lakes and lakes of skeletons, finally brought home in the lodges of our euphoric bodies. <laughs> Thank you.
Lee was surprised by that one too. Although being Lee, then she just recanted stories about her sex life, um, which were horrifying because she was 60 and I was like, whoa, whoa, details, details. And she'd slept with a lot of people that I knew. So uh, extra weird. Lee's going to kill me later. Um, well, that was going to happen sooner or later. Um, so this next poem is called uh, Look to the Hills. And it, I, I guess there's a story with it, but um, does anyone know the Bible? People know the Bible? You've heard of that thing, the Bible? I've heard of it too. Uh, and I'm actually reading this poem in honor of where I'm staying in Durham, um, which has a slight religious theme to it. And uh, so I preface this poem with uh, actually a quote from Psalms, um, the book of Psalms, I'm sure, written by David. Um, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. So let's look to the hills. O Lord of my Father, keeper of the tattered red hymn books and the sun falling on the polished wooden floor, do you see me? I am waiting in the deepening dark of this old church, brick and prayer raised up against rows of corn, the bleeding of sheep in the pasture singing your reluctant praises. Above me, the rows of pews are huddled together like farm women waiting for the next visitor, a brief moment of warmth, purpose rediscovered. I can hear the shuffling footsteps of my mother's gate, her small frame somewhere beneath me in the concrete basement, a broom in constant vigilance against the gravel dust of the small town she is buried in. I sing to you, O God of the meek, of my father sitting in his office, piecing together passages of a kind of truth, blind to the other reality awakening in my spine, my shaking, lesson, my shaking hands a lesson in weakness, vulnerability no angels can conquer. Can I climb up the tilting altar, raise my hands one stained window ledge to another, lift my heavy body into the height of your love, the circle of glass by the oak trees, a window to your heavenly sky, and wave, my maker? If I look to those hills, those dusty red wheat fields shaped by your children's labors, their sweat and offering to your mysterious cycles of rain, drought, and inflation, will you come to me? In thunder and in lightning, in storm and fury, God of the earthly salt, will you appear to me in robes of white, reach out your hand, and press the bruise on my shoulder? the mark your deacon left behind when he held me against the cold floor. Will you? O oh, Christ of my family, who brings the rain and raises the waters, can you drown my shame? The knowledge of man and his hunger, lust for what is closest to you? I am a child no more. And you, O oh God of men, are no God either. Let the trumpets proclaim your death, father of nothing. The night is here. My mother is calling my name as I lift myself off the floor, up into the electric light and away from you. I waited at your doorstep all day after he left me alone downstairs, bitter caramel candy in my mouth, and God, I can't wait any longer. So. I said back to the dark and I wasn't kidding. Um, and then this next piece is also satire too. Uh, it's called Advice for Abused Children. And I wrote a series of poems in this collection called Advice for Abused Children, partly because when you are an abuse survivor, like I am, you get the worst advice from people, often unsolicited, uh, but sometimes from social workers. And they just say the most terrible garbage to you, like, parents always love their kids. And you're like, listen, honey, I wouldn't be in your office office if parents always love their kids. Like, let's get real with each other here. Um, and it, it drove me crazy. And so then I wrote these, these uh, series of poems, Advice for Abused Children, uh, as a way, I guess, of responding to all the terrible advice that I'd ever been given by anyone. Advice for Abused Children. The most important thing to remember is everything was your fault. Don't trust the friendly social worker whose office is littered with framed photographs of her happy family. 
She only works here to remind you that there are other children who can hear a door latch lifting in the night without grabbing the kitchen knife hidden under the pillow and praying to a deaf god who likes to watch. Try to forget about childhood friends who invite you to sleepovers and stay up late watching horror movies while their parents benevolently make microwave bags of popcorn and tell you to come over more often. They can never be anything but a slap in the face and you get enough of that at home. Investigate all possible routes out of the house and make sure you never lock any of the bedroom windows because the rooftop is the safest place in the event of an unexpected violation. Pick a favorite place in the surrounding neighborhood so you have somewhere to wander around after school before you go home to the next beating. If you have any sudden desire to escape by breaking down and telling school officials, you should remind yourself that you are a liar who deserves every rough word and sharp jab. They will only call your parents and politely ask them if they have ever hit you more than once in any other area than the ass. Your best bet is to find an overly sympathetic friend whose parents work as doctors or teachers so you can hide out at their house for a couple of days until the charm of helping the less fortunate wears off and the reality of just how fucked up you are really becomes clear. Whatever you do, never forget to stop fighting and just let it happen as many times as it needs to. An act of resistance will only make the shame of losing worse. Honestly speaking, the best advice I can give you is to drown yourself at birth. And then one final piece and I will get off your stage and leave you to what I imagine will be a much more joyous celebration. And this is called Answering Machine Message to an Old Lover. And you can tell from my performance I have a lot of those. <laughs> Who would want to stay with this? God, so depressing. Ugh. <laughs> Answering machine message to an old lover. I'm so fucking tired of pretending to be your silent witness. Just another part of the land you step over, pass through like a spring thaw melting winter's resolve. I've become too complacent in the heat of your gaze, slow and stunned like a heavy beast in the rut of your cock. Kept my mouth shut and tongue silent as you strutted around, waving your belligerent hands like beacons in the night, calling all the lost people home to your temporary radiance. If I said you were a shooting star, I meant you lack stamina. But you've got the gift of misinterpretation, don't you, baby? Call me easy, but at least I'm not as cheap as you. Any good illusionist wins the four-minute drive of your affection, gets to send you home in cabs drunk and talking big. Speaking of size, you are a gifted contortionist where it counts, making mountains out of mohills and coaxing your way into the warm dens of strangers with a clever smile. You know too much for me to keep you around, but I can't get the stains out of my quilts, like a deepening regret which spreads with every washing. I've said too little, and now I've gone and said too much, from the covert protection of words and finely minced bullshit. Better luck next time. Find yourself a real Indian woman who can fry your eggs and skin your moose, if you know what I mean. I just called to let you know your check is in the mail, and I've shot the dog. <laughs> Please leave your key behind the same old excuses and think of me when you get jumped in a dark alley. <laughs> Lovely being here, miigwech. <laughs>